So you've decided to start a vegetable garden. Good on you, it's the best decision you will ever make, but there are plenty of pitfalls to avoid. Hi, I'm Ben, and today I'm going to show you the five most important things you need to know before laying the foundations of your new garden. Things I wish I'd known when I was starting out. Get them right and you're well on the way to abundant harvests. If you want to get the most from the space you're growing your own delicious and nutritious veggies from, you'll first need to consider very carefully where you're going to grow them. And the same principles apply no matter the size of the plot. The first thing to consider is light. Now, most vegetables need direct sunshine, about six to eight hours a day, and that's especially important in cooler climates such as mine. However, if you're gardening in a hot climate, then you'll want somewhere that gets both sunshine, but also a bit of shade, especially in the summer months, so you can grow cooler season crops like cabbage and spinach more successfully. It's really worth taking the time to make a note of where shade is cast during the course of the day, so you can see the best place for your plot. You can do something about overhanging branches, for example, but what you can't do is obviously move buildings or plants outside of your boundary. Bear in mind prevailing and buffeting winds. The ideal garden will be sunny for at least part of the day and sheltered from the worst of the winds. Next up is soil. Ideally, you want the soil to be relatively well drained and moisture attentive. The bottom part of my garden gets really, really wet in winter, which is why I decided to locate the main vegetable growing area uphill from there. It's better drained. Now, not every garden is gonna have the perfect conditions and some compromises will of course be made. This garden does get a reasonable amount of sunshine, but it's relatively exposed to the wind. Still, on balance, this is the best place for growing vegetables in my garden. With the general location decided on, the next step is to plan the layout of the garden itself. Now, this garden uses a series of raised beds divided up by paths, and that makes it very easy to zone the garden for things like uh, crop planning and, of course, crop rotation. Raised beds also offer the advantage of freer draining soil, which means it's less likely to get saturated in the very wet winters we have here. I've made certain that the middle of the beds can easily be reached from the sides for things like uh, pulling up weeds and harvesting. That's important because you don't want to get an oversaw back from overstretching, and it means you never have to step on the soil, so it avoids compacting it. That makes for a bed width of around four feet or 1.2 meters maximum. The paths are wide enough to be able to face the bed head on and tend it. Ideally, in fact, I'd now make the paths a little wider, at least 18 inches or 45 centimeters, and that will allow a wheelbarrow to comfortably pass in between the beds. Now, getting this right, getting your path widths right, getting your bed widths right is so worth it at this planning stage because it'll make tending your crops a lot easier. And even if you're not using raised beds because your soil is free draining enough, still take the time to lay out proper paths and growing areas. And that way you can put all of your soil amendments on the soil and not waste it on the paths. And also you'll be less inclined to walk on the growing areas too. Watering can be a big job in the summer. Now, my nearest water barrel is down here at the bottom of my garden. That's not ideal. It'll make watering thirsty crops so much easier if you can locate your new vegetable garden close to a water source, or if that's not possible, at least have the option to install more areas to collect water for use on site. The shed behind me is really close to the vegetable garden, and yet it doesn't have a water barrel attached to it yet. My plans for this year are to put that right. Install as many water collection barrels as you can and do it now so you'll have plenty of rainwater, which is by far the best plant-friendly water to irrigate with. It's also worth investing in a high quality hose with a decent attachment. My hose connects right around the front of my house, some distance from the vegetable garden, would you believe it? So I've invested in a durable hose that extends quite a long way. The spray nozzle has several settings to cover all eventualities. Other things to include in your layout are a composting area, more on that in a bit, and a seating area, or at least somewhere you can pop a seat because you'll want to stop, sit back and admire your hard work from time to time. With your location and layout decided upon, your next priority should be to get to work on your beds and growing areas as soon as possible, so you're ready to sow and plant when the time comes. 
Winter is actually a great time to do this because growth has slowed to a crawl, giving you a bit of a head start. The first step is to remove any larger rocks and debris before getting on and tackling those weeds. Starting off a new vegetable garden without weeds is really important because it means there's less competition, you've got clean and tidy growing areas, and of course crops will thrive because of it. Weeds, like any plant, need light to survive, so one way to control them and help tackle them is simply to cover them. In most cases, this is simply a question of mowing weeds or pasture down to the ground and then covering with at least four inches or 10 centimetres of organic matter, perhaps with a layer of cardboard on the underside as an extra barrier. That's what I did for my raised beds, cardboard and then the compost. You'll need to cover the paths over too, so weeds don't creep in from the sides and into your beds. Alternatively, have grass paths that are mown regularly. My vegetable garden is surrounded by lawn on three sides, which means no weeds can get in from that side. The paths themselves were initially covered with cardboard and are now topped up with wood chips as necessary. Perennial weeds, that's weeds that last for more than one season, are notoriously hard to get rid of because they've got long searching roots or deep tap roots, and that makes them really quite hard to kill. Now you can try covering them with cardboard and then compost as before, and then pulling out or hoeing off any that do make it through, and you will eventually win the battle like that. A more thorough alternative perhaps is to cover the entire area with a light excluding membrane, such as dark polythene. This will severely weaken the weeds or even kill them off. Weeds obviously grow faster during the growing season when it's warmer, but putting these measures in place now will get you a bit of a head start for when growth does resume. Perhaps the area for your new vegetable garden has already been cleared of weeds or you just plan to smother them out of existence. Well, the next thing for you to turn your attention to is the soil. Few gardens have the perfect soil for growing vegetables, but almost all of them can be improved by adding plenty of this stuff. Oh, beautiful, rich, organic matter, such as well-rotted manure, compost, or leaf mold. The earlier you get on and improve the soil, the more time it has to settle down, ready for sowing and planting. I use no-dig methods of growing. This has a number of advantages. Soil is left undisturbed, so its intricate network of soil life can thrive, which will in turn support superior crop growth. By not digging the soil, you're leaving the weed seeds buried, which means fewer weeds. And of course, it saves a lot of time and effort digging. It goes hand in hand with the smothering method of weed control, because in most cases, you won't have to wait for the weeds to die before getting on and planting. So when starting new no-dig areas, it's simply a matter of dumping your organic matter on top of the existing soil and letting the worms dig it in for you. Get on and do this now, so the worms have plenty of time to do it before the start of the growing season. A thriving vegetable garden can take a surprising amount of compost, so it really pays to make as much of your own as you can. As well as getting on and improving your soil, usually with bought-in bags of compost or manure, now's the time to get on and set up your composting area. Ideally, it will have two heaps, one that's active, that you're putting stuff onto, and another maturing. I've made a video on composting and I'll pop a link to it down below. The first season of your new vegetable garden will see it fill up quickly, cleared weeds, grass clippings, leaves and kitchen waste. Locate it within your vegetable garden if you can, or at least close by, so you won't have far to carry both composting ingredients coming off the garden and mature compost going back on. With growing areas set up, you're now ready to begin your planting plan. This is the really exciting moment. We've done lots of videos on how to choose what to grow, including ideas for all sorts of locations, such as uh, shadier spots. I'll pop some links to them down below and also look out for the playlist at the end. Now, I'd start with those vegetables that are gonna be in the same piece of ground for many years. The perennial vegetables like rhubarb and asparagus, as well as fruit bushes and so on. Please do take your time in considering where these permanent plantings will go, because you won't want to dig them up once they're planted. Locating them towards the edge of the garden makes the most sense, bearing in mind, of course, taller crops. As for the rest of your veggies, well, start by prioritizing what you like to eat, and especially important in smaller gardens, what will be most productive. So that's crops like climbing beans, zooks or courgettes, 
tomatoes, salad leaves and roots like carrot and beets or beetroot. If you're new to vegetable gardening and how exciting, consider using software such as the garden planner that I'm using here. It will help you to get the spacings between plants right, so there's no risk of overcrowding, a rookie mistake every gardener has been guilty of. In doing so, this will help you minimise waste by showing you exactly how many plants you will need and, crucially, when to sow or plant and when you can expect to harvest. The garden planner can even help you choose what crops grow best together. Companion planting like this can really turbocharge your success and we'll be looking at this underrated method of growing in a future video, so do watch out for that. In fact, we've got some really cracking videos coming up over the next few months to help both new and seasoned gardeners alike to get the very most from the coming growing season. I really don't want you to miss out because there's some really great stuff in the pipeline, so subscribe and ding the notification bell so you're notified every time we upload a new video for you. Thanks for watching, happy planning, and I'll catch you next time.